Okay. Welcome to another episode of Stories from the Edge of Life. We have once again a very special guest, Dr. Muhammad Hidayatullah. Uh, welcome, Dr. Hidayatullah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prague, uh, for inviting me for this uh, special session that you are making. It's a great uh, contribution to the uh, palliative care, and I think a lot of people seeing this will get inspired to take up this speciality and uh, serve the patients uh, who are suffering across the world. In some areas, they are very, uh, very much uh, short of these services and it would be very helpful for them. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very for much. Your kind words. And uh, would you mind introducing yourself to our audience, please? Yeah, um, I am actually a palliative care physician. Uh, just uh, resigned from my position as a consultant uh, in palliative medicine from a very a uh, big uh, uh, Saudi Arabian hospital or uh, the biggest cancer center in the Middle East, King Faisal Specialist Hospital. And currently I'm living in London and uh, working or, or contributing as an independent consultant in palliative medicine and also as an educator, wherever I get a chance to teach about palliative medicine and cancer pain management, I'm, I'm ready to do that uh, as a service. So this is uh, background and I, I I am trained as an anesthesiologist to begin with, begin with, and then uh, my journey progressed into um, pain management, then into finally landed in palliative care. So that's how uh, my, that's my short introduction. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, and I'm Parag Bharadwaj. I'm a hospice and palliative medicine physician, uh, and I had had the honor of. Uh, having connected with Dr. Hidayatullah more than a decade ago and have been in touch uh, off and on. So, Dr. Hidayatullah, I think you've understated all your experience and uh, all that you've done. So let's let's uh, dissect it a little bit for the audience. Uh, but to begin with, take us back in time in terms of when you completed med school, uh, uh, you know, was there even a concept of palliative care and how did you actually get to know about it and uh, start working in this speciality? Yeah, the main, actually, I completed my medicine in uh, uh, Hyderabad from Gandhi Medical College uh, in 1985. And after that, I was practicing uh, as a general physician for some time, then joined uh, anesthesia training and I completed my anesthesia in uh, uh, 92. Um, then after that, uh, I was you know, a busy anesthesia uh, practitioner. I was going from nursing home to nursing home and also working in a, a big hospital, um, you know, working as an anesthetist. That, uh, that uh, you know, work took almost two years. And after that, uh, by chance, I, I was, uh, you know, one of, uh, 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 anesthesia uh, head of the section from or a chairman from one of a big hospital in uh, Saudi Arabia, King Faisal Special Hospital, hospital Dr. Sami. He was he's an American citizen right now, retired and living in uh, Chicago. He, he was visiting one of our hospital where I was working as an anesthetist, uh, and uh, he gave a lecture on pain management. It was very interesting. I was attending that, and after that, after the lecture, I I went and talked to him, and um, he, uh, sh seeing my curiosity and my interest, he said, I can offer you a job to run an acute pain service in in that hospital from where he belonged, you know. So immediately, uh, you know, it was a very, very shocking, uh, you know, offer for me in the sense that I was not ready to, I was having a very good practice. Uh, at that time, uh, established anesthesia practice. As you know, maybe from uh, Indian background, you may be knowing that people who are doing uh, many nursing homes are very busy and are making good money. Uh, so that was a very sudden and uh, and um, other thing that I was worried about is that if I move to pain management, I may forget about my anesthesia. So I said, no, I'm <laughs> I'm happy here at this moment. But when I came back to uh, home, you know, one of my brother was uh, for working at Saudi Arabia at that time in, in a different field, but he heard a lot about this hospital, King Faisal Specialist Hospital, it was run by Americans under 
uh, you know, Duke University, Washington, uh, is the one who were running that hospital or who established that hospital. And it was almost like an, uh, an extension of an American hospital with all the same uh, you know, protocols and same medication, same and and, and the majority of the uh, uh, physicians at the time were American. So, you know, he said, you know, why you refuse this, uh, you know, great offer, you know, you don't know, uh, in this hospital, if you work, you probably will get an experience that will make you a very uh, good uh, physician, and it will, you know, be of value for you in, in your future career. So next day, I went to his home and said, I'm interested. <laughs> he said, oh, you said no yesterday, so how come you change your mind? I said, uh, yeah, I thought about it in the night, and I I've decided, and I, I took my uh, CV and uh, copies of my uh, certifications and all that, and gave it to him. He said, okay. So he took it, and um, um, and after about uh, a month, uh, you know, I got a um, phone call from one of his relatives that you have some papers uh, sent from Saudi Arabia. And uh, I remember that on that day, you know, I was going to do a cesarean section, an emergency cesarean section. So, I could not uh, even, I was, while going, I took that uh, cover and went to that nursing home. And while the patient, I gave a spinal anesthesia to that lady. And while she was undergoing the procedure, I opened the envelope and found uh, tickets. And uh, all the documents of my appointment and other things were there, offer letter and everything. I was uh, surprised. And uh, after, you know, gaining some sensation myself, <laughs> I read about it and then, you know, like I prepared and in a, I think in, in a month or one and a half months that I was in Saudi Arabia. And there I was running a hip pain service and also helping in pain clinic. So that was a journey to pain uh, management. And there, you know, all the pain procedures were taking place. And acute pain service were actually established in 92 in Duke University, Washington, two years back in 92. So in 94, I was uh, working in uh, full running the acute pain service uh, with patient control analgesia machines, uh, automatic, you know, and also epidural uh, infusions to control the all the uh, all the postoperative patients. So all patients who are undergoing major surgeries were provided with the the either patient control analgesia with morphine or with an epidural paste and run the local anesthetic and uh, fentanyl and bupuric and whatever it is. So that was going on. This happened till, uh, and also I was doing procedures in the pain clinic, uh, like blocks and uh, other things and helping my other colleagues, uh, consultants to do that. So during that uh, time, I was also taking care of cancer patients. Uh, and when I was do going and um, uh, doing blocks or uh, uh, epidurals, running epidurals for patients with excruciating pain in their abdomen because of the malignancies, I was feeling that these patients were, you know, like we are doing a mechanical job of putting a catheter and running the infusions, but, you know, they are having other, um, you know, aspects of suffering. And as you, you know, when I joined the palliative care, I understood the concept of total pain, where the psychological, spiritual, and uh, social suffering and all that. But I was unaware of this at that time. But, you know, I felt the need to take care of this patient more holistically rather than just simple pain management by a procedure or by a chemical. So in that quest, you know, while I was doing that in 1998, I think American um, Board of uh, Hospice and Palliative Medicine came into existence. And this was a new board, so they started conducting exams and opened for people who are having a uh, background of patients Taking, uh, of treating cancer pain or uh, taking care of the patients with the uh, uh, cancer uh, in any aspect, and they opened this. And I found it as an opportunity. But they they wanted uh, to work at least for two years in the palliative medicine before taking that ex exam, the board. Uh, so I requested the palliative, uh, because in 92, there was also in our hospital, one of the consultant, Dr. Alan Gray, he started uh, practicing uh, palliative medicine along. He was a radiation oncologist. He was from New Zealand. So along with the 
um, uh, sorry, I'm a little pocket here and very, because when I'm going into the history, all the thoughts are coming to my mind. So this is great. So, this is great. Thank you. Yeah. So Dr. Alan Gray was running, uh, you know, a symptom management uh, uh, also along with his traditional oncology uh, practice. So uh, he expanded this palliative care department in our hospital in 92, which was very new and very unique in the whole Middle East. Uh, and uh, he invited some of the other consultants to come and join. So two doctors, from uh, one from Canada and one from uh, New Zealand, came and joined and was running the service. So I applied for you know, working there as an assistant consultant because I was young and without any, but they refused saying that you don't have uh, enough qualification to work in uh, the, at, the administrative, not the, the physician themselves. So again, uh, I just kept, kept myself in pain, pain management dedicated. But after a year or two, you know, there was a, um, a shortage of physicians there, you know, as suddenly, um, after the Gulf War, or maybe because of some other crisis, they, a lot of physicians left the hospital uh, because of some political situation there. So when they went, you know, the, the department felt the need of a physician and they found that, you know, I being having a, a cancer pain or pain and background will be a suitable candidate. And they invited me and I, at the time I joined. And after working for two years, in 2003, I joined there and worked for two years. In 2005, I took the American Board of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. I passed, and that was valid for uh, seven years. Uh, so it was up till 2012, it was uh, uh, valid. Anyway, so that was how I moved to the palliative medicine. And after that, again, you know, I was, uh, it was a very established unit in King Faisal Specialist Hospital with a dedicated ward of uh, eight beds and uh, a lot of opiates were available to be used freely. And there was, you know, it was a very unique thing in the whole Middle East. There was no palliative care existing in that region. I should say, not even in Middle East, even if you see the Africa and uh, in Indian subcontinent and other countries, palliative care was very new. So uh, after working for another two years there, in, um, after acquiring this uh, board, I thought I should go somewhere and start a new service by myself. And so me and another colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Azza Hassan, so we decided to migrate to some new pastures <laughs> or greener pastures, not in the sense of uh, money, but as a, a speciality where there is no speciality. So I moved to UAE, uh, United Arab Emirates. And in Tawam Hospital, uh, was a, there is a good cancer, uh, the biggest cancer center of the whole uh, uh, United Arab Emirates. There, uh, Dr. Christensen was a hematologist, oncologist, who was the head of the service. I wrote to him that I am interested in studying service there. So he, again, there was some back and forth because the administration was higher up in Abu Dhabi, which was, um, they have to give me permission to do that. So there was, again, back and forth, then they opened and said, okay, you can come and start. So I joined there as a specialist, started the first palliative care program of the Abu Dhabi. While my colleague, Dr. Azza Hassan, went to Qatar and started another service there in uh, Hamad Hospital. So I being the, you know, some people call me father of palliative care in UAE, though the, <laughs> the people, the government may not recognize it, but the people who, who have uh, whose lives have touched and who have uh, worked with, they they uh, they still remember me there. So that way the service was started there. And for six years I was there and uh, the department became, a, you know, I, invite, I hired some other doctors to join the service. Now, if you, uh, it will be very surprising to know that uh, in Abu Dhabi there are all the major hospitals have some palliative care services. Um, so it was from 2006 that I went, or 2007, January, I went to Tawam Hospital and started the service. Till now, it has flourished, and uh, there are palliative care services in American Hospital, Dubai, and uh, some other hospitals, with government hospitals. Every government hospital has some service there. Similarly, Saudi Arabia also, you know, they started in 92, 
and slowly the service has expanded. But now, if you see there is, it has become a specialty recognized by this uh, Saudi uh, Medical Specialties Board. And now uh, we ourselves in our hospital in King Faisal, there are ten, ten fellows getting trained every year. So it's a it's a big thing now. And all the major hospitals have palliative care uh, physicians. So this is how it uh, happened. I in 2012 I I moved from UAE back to King Faisal because there was some requirement and uh, I felt that there was some other reasons for that and I moved to and till from 2012 to 2023 I was there and in April, in uh, February uh, or April 2023 I moved from uh, uh, King Faisal and came to London to stay with my daughter. Yeah. This is the, in short, the journey of my, <laughs> uh, you know, life or my career. What a journey. Thanks. Thanks for uh, taking us through it. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, so you've seen a lot of changes from a point of yes. where, you know, Paripke was not well known to now when you said you pioneered Paripke care in the in you know the region uh, in certain locations and uh, now it's a thriving field so uh, how does it feel to have institute yeah i, I feel very happy that yeah. you know uh, in whatever way i contributed um, you know it has definitely uh, in the region there is some you know like everybody who is associated with palliative care knows me at least I get uh, whenever I see other physicians, even if they don't, uh, did not meet me personally, they say that uh, we know your name. <laughs> so that gives me a lot of uh, uh, happiness and uh, uh, you know a feeling of content, a lot of uh, satisfaction that uh, you know like people know me in this field at least. Yeah. Now. So it's it's interesting because you were you're originally from India, you were working in the Middle East, and from what I can tell, you have a lot of, a huge expatriate patient, uh, population in the in the Middle East, meaning foreigners in in the Middle East from different countries. Yeah. So I'm sure you you must have seen a lot of different perspectives. Um, how was it taking care of patients? that were native to the country, but also patients from, uh, you know, different parts of the world? Did you have to change your strategy? Did you have to, uh, what, what are the things that you had to take into account when you were taking care of these patients? Yeah, um, you know, like in UAE, which is um, a melting pot of uh, different uh, cultures and nationalities, if you know that uh, UAE, the population, only uh, around 20% of the populations are the uh, locals or, or the Emiratis. The rest, 80% are the non-Emirati population. So there, my patients used to be mixed. And you know, like out of, um, uh, we had a 10-bed unit in Tawam Hospital. Uh, we had only two to three um, Emirati patients. The rest of the patients were Arabs uh, from, from the Middle Asian countries like um, Turks or maybe uh, from Uzbekistan or, or maybe sometimes uh, Asian uh, or uh, sorry, uh, Eastern European patients used to be there and sometimes even Westerners used to be our patients. So, you know, like uh, and a lot of Arab uh, from the other our Arab Arabian countries like Jordan, Palestinians, all they used to be there and also a lot of Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, these patients. So our uh, unit used to be a mixed uh, cultural pot, uh, and all the patients we used to see have different uh, cultural backgrounds. I remember uh, seeing patients who are very strict uh, uh, religious Arabic um, Muslims uh, patients, as well as I've seen um, you know very strict Hindu patients. You know, like very religious. I saw a patient with um, you know who was a astrologer and when he was very old and very you know can't even see blindness when he held my hand 
when I was holding his, uh, his hand and in the last few days of his life and talking to him compassionately with one hand on his head. And he just felt my, the, the lines on my palm and, you know, told me the, my future. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't believe in astrology to, to a great extent. But uh, he told that you are dominated by females in your home. And to tell you the truth, I have only daughters. I don't have a son. <laughs> he was just a few, you know, like, so such a type of uh, interactions used to take place with our patients. You know, we were so uh, close and, you know, like to connect with the patient. That was one of my uh, mantra I used to t even tell to my staff uh, because I was the head of the palliative care service in Tawam. I used to teach my staff that, you know, apart from being a physician or a nurse or a social worker, you have to connect with the patient, you know, like when you, you hold the hand of the patient, they should feel as if a family member or a close uh, relate to you or a son or a brother or a sister is there who is holding the hand. You know, such type of feeling should develop between the patient and the caretaker. So this was my, uh, you know, thing. Even in when I was uh, left the King Faisal, I was teaching the my fellows. You know, about ten fellows used to be there, uh, which uh, you know uh, I was teaching actively to them, and I used to give this uh, practical lessons from apart from the half of morphine or the or the <laughs> pharmacokinetics of fentanyl, you know, these are the things which are very important in palliative care. Great. And uh, you, as you mentioned, palliative care is a team sport. So can you share a little bit about how over the years, I'm assuming when you started, it was probably just you and skeleton team support, right? But then yeah. over time, as the concept got more uh, implemented and institutions started adopting the concept of palliative care, I'm assuming you were given a bigger team uh, in terms of providing support to patients. So can you shed light on how you utilize the, the, the non-physician team members uh, to bring about you know, comfort for patients and their families? Yeah, you know, in in the setup where you know palliative care is a very new speciality, you you will not find a whole multidisciplinary team. You know, there are always players who who are not uh, having any specialized training, but they have the heart to to serve the uh, or to serve the patients, or they even when they see us working, like. I remember one uh, uh, social worker, actually she was not a, exactly a social worker in Tawam Hospital, a, a Marathi lady. When she was exposed to our work, she was so moved and she was very helpful all the time. So she used to come and attend our multidisciplinary meeting, uh, meetings and contribute. And whenever a patient uh, dies, I used to call her and she used to come and uh, give it, uh, um, you know, like uh, support to the bereaving members of the family and and used to call them afterwards. And this used to be a regular thing, you know. Apart from physics, uh, the nurses, you know, all this, uh, if you, I tell you the truth, many of us, even I was not even, you know, trained in U.S. What I acquired knowledge is by by reading books and also coming in contact with and treating pain management. That's what I was doing. I'm trained as an anesthetist. But, uh, you know, if you have a special type of feeling for the patient, then you can, uh, because there can be palliative care physicians with the qualifications. But in true sense, palliative care is not a, not a, a subject to be read in the books. It is a a philosophy. It needs a person because once I was, when I was uh, initially going from uh, uh, Saudi Arabia to UAE, you know, uh, because a lot of people they come and they, they attended my farewell function, and one of the uh, physicians came and hold my hand and said, "You were made a pal you were born a palliative care physician." So this needs a special uh, personality you know, a, a, a special 
uh, feeling for the patients that that need to be there. You know, if if you just have a degree to to show on the wall or acquired some uh, qualifications, you will not make a good palliative care physician. Palliative care physician should be from inside. It is a mission. It is a philosophy that you have to have imbibed in your own self, in your own personality. When you see a patient suffering, your heart should melt. You know, like you should be, you know, that's the difference between a compassion, sympathy, and empathy. You know, sympathy is like you are sympathizing with somebody, but empathy is when you are feeling the pain of a person. If not to that extent, even a little extent, if you feel that, you know, you should, it should make you uncomfortable yourself when you see a person having pain or suffering with any reason. So that type of quality should be there to be a palliative care physician. And I've, you know, like people have real, have said that I have that. I, I don't want to, uh, I don't know whether I have it or not, but the people have felt that, you know, whenever I'm taking care of the patients and then talking to them, you know, it moved their uh, hearts and, you know, and uh, to tell you, I don't want to just brag about my work, but, uh, you know, when I was leaving about three, four, uh, five months back when I was leaving King Faisal, uh, a patient uh, who was having a colon cancer used to come every month uh, to my clinic. And uh, he was a very, he was a good businessman uh, and a very educated family. And the wife, when I, because my clinic used to be overbooked, I used to tell him that, I will give next, because you are comfortable, I will give next appointment after three months. So he used to insist, no, I want to come next month. I said, why? Uh, you know, you are comfortable. Then the wife used to say that, no, he just want to come and see you. And he sit with you and talk to you. And it gives him a lot of, uh, you know, relief and satisfaction. So this is, you know, a type of uh, interaction that you should uh, have with the patient especially the cancer patients with a lot of suffering. So this is uh, what I practiced and I, I recommend all the palliative care physician uh, if to achieve the best results, this is how we should approach. Thank you. And <clears throat> I'm sure like I can see why the physician came and said you were born to be a palliative care physician. And I'm sure so would the audience agree with that notion uh, and uh, yes you're right the uh, you know just having a conversation with the patient it can be very therapeutic for them so uh, thanks for being there for you know that one patient and I'm sure you were there for a lot more uh, many more that that needed your assistance uh, last question so you had you brought up the issue of empathy and uh, let's touch upon you know, when you're taking care of patients and uh, in difficult circumstances uh, and you're empathizing with them, how do you take care of yourself? Or yeah, it, you... was, it used to be very draining, you know, uh, especially when a person is close to death and we cannot do anything for them to save their life. The family members looking at us with a big question on their head, what you're going to do? Uh, and, you know, like at the time, we used to feel very, you know, like me and my team members used to feel very drained, you know. But as we are, you know, taught that be there, just be there and uh, uh, be a part of the whole situation. Even if you can't do anything, uh, if you just uh, keep a, a hand on the back of uh, one of the relative and give a shoulder for them to uh, to rest their head and let them uh, you know and that happened very uh, in a has a very huge therapeutic effect not even for the patient as well as from the family the patients usually in the last few hours are uh, you know like disconnected from the uh, sur surrounding or the situation or the, they are not aware of what's happening but the family members used to, you know, like they used to come afterwards, after that a day or two, and uh, thank us that you have been there and it has given a very 
big uh, you know help for us to go through that uh, crisis uh, as i mentioned to you that uh, astrologer from india who who felt my palm and uh, uh, told me about my future and my background you know after a month after his death his wife very old lady also they were from gujarat and he brought a, a um, uh, envelope and gave it to me and said this is uh, my gift for you or sort of a thank you gift for you i said what's there and uh, i called my social worker to come and open that and there were 2000 dirhams in that you know this is how this you know when if you are there at that time when the 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 the, the, the tragedy is happening to the family and the, if you just stand there and support them afterwards when they you know they feel very lightened uh, afterward when think about that situation you know that one doctor was who was there all the time even you know there are a lot of uh, physicians are there you know there are a lot of specialties i will not blame the physicians there are specialties where the people are used to get chocolates and flowers like a gynecologist always after a, a delivery in the fatic family the life is a, a, the, the 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 gift of god after that they they get a lot of sweets and chocolates and all this but you know the when the patient is dying there is nobody uh, to to give you anything but if you can give something to them by being there that will be a, you know the best thing and they will realize and they come back and thank you i i received many thank you gifts not the gifts i should say cards and their verbal uh thanks are received from the patients who died and after that they realized and they came and did the set was and you know when i was practicing medicine not the palliative care medicine in the government hospitals in india during my training period whenever death occurs in the family members used to get agitated sometimes they used to uh assault the doctor and raise questions what this happened why that happened and a lot of commotion used to be there but when i was working in palliative care i was seeing the death almost on a very uh, frequent uh, very frequently but i never came across any agitation because we were there to help them through the and prepare them for the eventuality and that used to give a lot of sorry lot of uh, relief for them to to deal with the the things that is happening and they get prepared for that so that uh, used to be a different uh, perspective thank you so much i would i would uh, request the audience to actually uh, you know listen to especially the last part of the wisdom that uh, dr hidayatullah has shared and what makes pedicure unique and special and uh, so thank you so much for shedding light about your career you. and uh, it's been very inspiring and uh, Uh, you know i know in the first part where you sh- shared your journey what a story and uh, so so i know you you mentioned you're retired but you're still pretty active and we wish you the best and thanks for uh, still making time to assist physicians and uh, patients thank you thank you for listening to my story and uh, uh, if it can uh, be some inspiration to anybody i'll be most rewarded i will feel more rewarded <laughs> Of course Thank it's you. it's, a, it's be, always been an inspiration for me and I'm sure it's a, it's going to be for others too so we'll have you back and talk a little bit about how uh, you know your experiences have shaped your personal opinions about uh, important things in life so we'll have you back soon thank you thank you okay sure thank you bye